Greetings to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us for our online worship service today. We are so glad that you decided to be a part of this, and we pray that this time gathered around God's Word, even if we are doing so through a distance, would be a blessing to you. Just a few quick announcements from the Announcements Bulletin. As always, try to download that Announcements PDF, look through it, but I want to just get some of the highlights from there. January 31st, this Sunday, we have a voters meeting. This is our regular January voters meeting that we have every year. So there are items of business listed there in the bulletin for you to look at, but it would be great if you could join us for that. It's at 12.30 p.m., a little bit after the late service when we have time to take some things down and become ready for the service. Sunday School is not yet meeting in person, but they do want you to know that they have links to some of the Sunday School lessons. So at home, you can still go through those lessons with your kids and continue learning with them uh, with God's Word. There's also announcements for our school. February 11th from 5 to 7 p.m., this is a Thursday, the school has an open house. So if you know people who are interested in our school, they want to see some of the classrooms, some of our teachers, please do let them know that important date. We would love to be able to meet them. There is also an announcement about the school pork chop and silent auction dinner. That takes place March 20th, but there's some information you need to know beforehand. We will be selling tickets for it beginning February 13th, but what is it? Well, it will be a drive through pork chop dinner. So you can grab the food and you can go, you can eat it at home. You don't have to worry about social distancing or any of that stuff. But another component of it is also a auction. And so we are collecting items for that auction. And uh, there is information at the school site. You can uh, inquire in the office if you're not actually at the school so that you can have the right paperwork to be able to give to businesses so that when they donate to this auction, they can also get the, the tax credits for that donation. If you have any, any questions about that, just contact us in the school office. One last thing, there is also a note about February 13th and 14th. That weekend, LWML will be having their might collection. We were scheduled to have LWML's special Sunday in November during the time when we were not having in-person worship services. And so we wanted to try to bring that back. We're not going to have a full-blown LWML Sunday, but we did want to have that mite collection because those mites go towards so many good service projects and opportunities. We wanted to make sure that we did our part to be able to bring those mites to the uh, Northern Illinois District and to the body as a whole for Lutheran Women Missionary League. Those are all the announcements for our worship service that I was going to draw your attention to. So now we turn our eyes to the service itself. We are still in the season of Epiphany. This is a season where we see the revelation of Jesus, who he truly is, not merely a human, but the Son of God. And in our gospel reading today, we see Jesus at work in his mission, bringing disciples to follow himself and proclaiming the kingdom of God that is at hand, that has come in Jesus himself. So we'll be thinking more about that and Jesus's call to ministry in our message today. With that, we begin with our opening hymn.
Dear friends, we begin our time together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My dear friends in Christ, let us humble our hearts before our holy God and take a moment of silent reflection upon our sin and God's grace. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant to the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and at the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, you turn the hearts of the prophet Jonah, and the apostles Peter and Paul, through their preaching, caused your call to repentance and salvation to be proclaimed. Bring us to true repentance. Fill us with faith in your word and send us to share your love with the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Jonah 3, starting at verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and the actions of our lives be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus' words in our gospel reading seem very simple, very elementary. Jesus simply says, follow me. But before we think those words are a little too simple, we kind of have to understand the context a little bit more. To us in our day, when we hear those words, it reminds us of social media, that you can be a follower of somebody on Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or Facebook, you name it. You can follow those people, and those people who get the most followers, they become influencers. Because what they say, what they tell others to do, the opinions that they share are then disseminated to many, many people. And whether they agree or disagree, they always will know what that particular person thinks on that given subject. That's our world. Jesus' world was not quite that way, obviously. When Jesus says those words, follow me, Those are not words that are really unique or unusual to Jesus. In fact, a lot of different people in Jesus' day could have uttered those same words, and people would have known what they meant. Most typically, those words, follow me, would have been uttered by a rabbi, a teacher, or a philosopher of some kind, who would speak those words to potential students, to potential disciples, The rabbi was trying to get those disciples to follow him. And the job of those disciples was to learn the ways of that rabbi, to listen to their teachings, to watch what they say and do, and then emulate that rabbi. Because one day that rabbi would die. And who would carry on the traditions? Who would pass on the wisdom from that rabbi? Well, that was the job of those disciples. So a disciple was somebody who carried on those traditions of their rabbi. And as it would happen, every rabbi carried on the traditions of their own rabbi. So over time, these disciples, who then would become rabbis themselves by telling others to follow them, they would be passing on so much wisdom, not just of their rabbi, but their rabbi's rabbi, and their rabbi's rabbi, and you kind of get the point. Jesus' call was a little bit different, though, because Jesus was a little bit different. So when he spoke those words to Simon and Andrew, to James and John, when Jesus said, follow me, the words themselves were not so unusual. What was so unusual was where Jesus would ask those disciples to follow him. Where was it that Jesus was ultimately taking those disciples? He would be taking them to the cross. That was the fulfillment of Jesus' mission and ministry. Now, to be sure, along the way, those disciples would see some pretty amazing things. They would see Jesus perform some mind-blowing miracles, that he would feed a crowd of 5,000 with just a few loaves of bread and fish. They would see Jesus raise the dead. They would see Jesus cleanse the lepers. They would see Jesus heal the paralyzed. They would hear Jesus' wisdom in some of his sermons. They would hear Jesus confront some of the best teachers of his day. They would also see Jesus be challenged by some of those same teachers, by some of the religious authorities of their day. But all of that was kind of ancillary. All of that was sort of at the edge of what it was that Jesus was doing. Jesus would ultimately reach his destination, though, when he went to the cross. And so for these disciples, as they hear Jesus' call, follow me, that would be understood as the call of a rabbi to disciples, that they would follow him. It would be a ask that they would emulate him, 
that they would imitate him. At least that's how it worked with a regular rabbi. But once again, Jesus was no regular rabbi, and what he was doing was so completely different. You can hear it from Jesus' own words. Jesus proclaimed to his disciples, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's not how an ordinary rabbi would preach. That's not the kind of thing that they would proclaim. But Jesus, Jesus could proclaim that the kingdom of God was at hand, that God's rule and mighty power was there among them, because Jesus was no ordinary rabbi. He was the Son of God. He was that king above all kings. Wherever Jesus was, there God's kingdom was at hand. Jesus ultimately was bringing to those disciples and to the whole world a new kind of kingdom, a kingdom of life. Because remember, all of those other disciples who would follow all of those other rabbis, they knew that at the end, their rabbis, their teachers would die. And it was up to them to pass on, to emulate what their rabbis taught them. And they knew that one day they too would die. And they would have to have new disciples to pass on what they taught. Jesus wasn't beginning that kind of teaching ministry. Jesus was bringing through himself an end to that chain, an end to that chain of death. Jesus was going to put an end to death altogether because there through the cross was life, eternal life, a new kind of life, not just for himself, but for the whole world. And so Jesus' own disciples weren't to imitate him. They were not to emulate him. They themselves were not to go to a cross and lay down their lives for the sins of the world. Rather, they were to go out and proclaim to others what Jesus had done. And so Jesus told those first disciples to repent to turn from all of the other ways of this world, to turn their allegiance away from all of the other teachers out there, away from all of the other authorities, even from their own desires, and to look to him and to believe the good news, the good news that was there in Jesus himself. Because Jesus was going to completely upset the whole world because the kingdom of God was at hand. The problem with this world was a problem that I think everybody pretty much understood. It's something that we understand in our day as well. We see it all the time in its form, death. But here's the thing. Death is itself not the only problem. In fact, death is a sign of a much greater problem, a problem that might be hidden to our eyes. The truth of the matter is that death is sin made visible. The wages of sin is death. But as all of us know and understand death, we know that it is an uncomfortable part of life. We know that it is painful. We know the separation that it causes. We know the grief that it causes. But that's not just sin that's doing that. Or that's not just death that's doing that. I just gave the point away. It's sin itself. Because behind death is sin. See, death is not a normal part of life. Death is not part of God's plan for you and for me. Rather, death is a part of life because sin is a part of life. Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, sin brings death. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. There's nothing we can do to get rid of death. Scientists can try. Doctors can try. You can try to get all of the, the right amounts of exercise. You can try to eat the right foods. You can do so many different things. And yeah, you might live a few years longer, 
than you would have lived had you not done those things. But eventually, death will come. It always comes. Because that is a part of our broken world. But Jesus comes into this cycle to disrupt the cycle, to break it completely. And he does that. He does that by undoing sin. If sin is behind death, the way to stop death is to undo the power of sin. And that's what the cross was all about. That Jesus, once and for all, would pay the price for all of our guilt, for all of our disobedience, for all of those times when we know the right thing to do, but we don't do it. That's what Jesus was trying to make sure those disciples knew, that they would follow him all the way to the cross so that they would see that that cycle of death, that cycle of sin has been broken. How? Because Jesus would bring forth the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of sins that would be made possible by his death, And wherever there is forgiveness of sins, there is life. That eternal life which God gives to you and me, it all flows right through the cross, right through Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus rose again on the third day because death could hold him no longer. Why? Because sin had been defeated. (laughs) Those disciples... There's no way they understood all of that in those opening days. But they didn't need to. It didn't depend on them, did it? Jesus was going to do it all. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand because he was there and he would lead them and guide them. All they needed to do was repent. Repent and believe the good news to see what Jesus had done, and to give thanks and rejoice. And so they did. So those disciples would follow Jesus to the end of his life. And even after his death, they didn't get it. But Jesus comes to them, comes to them on the third day. Jesus comes to them raised from the dead, and he assures them that everything has been accomplished. He had done it all, and he gives them that gift of life. He gives them the forgiveness of sins, and he tells them, it's now your jobs to go forth and tell others about this good news, this message of life, that they too could be a part of God's kingdom, not the kingdom of death, of this world, not the kingdom of sin, but the kingdom of life, everlasting life brought through the cross, brought only through Jesus. This time of the year, churches are often urged to recognize uh, the sanctity of life. Many churches have what they call Life Sunday. And we've done that in the past, and in a sense, this Sunday is kind of Life Sunday. But it's always hard to preach on that subject because it's always hard to address the fullness of what that means. That it means that life is holy. Holy because it comes from God himself. It is sacred, a gift from God. And that's all life. Very often, the one thing that we talk most about is about life in the womb and the problems of abortion in our world. And to be fair, those are problems. This is contrary to God's word. But the sanctity of human life is about life in all forms, from the womb all the way to the tomb. It has to do with how we treat one another. And that's at all stages of life. That means people from all walks of life. So it speaks to us in our world today, not just on the issue of abortion, but also on the issue of families, on 
mothers and fathers and on husbands and wives and how we support one another in all of those different relationships. It talks to how we treat one another when we are not very like one another. This country is plagued by some of the problems of inequality that sometimes have to do with male and female, that sometimes have to do with rich and poor, that sometimes have to do with the color of our skin, or the language we speak, or the place we live, or the jobs that we have. All of these things undermine that value that we are all creatures of our Heavenly Father. And when we talk about one particular issue, it means that we don't talk about other issues. And so what often happens is that we start to think, we're doing pretty good. We're doing a good job of following Jesus because we don't have abortions. We don't do this really bad thing. And we look down on others who have. We look down on others who commend it. The problem with all of this is that it just puffs us up. The problem with all of this is those who maybe have done some of these things, they feel like they have no place in God's kingdom. The thing missing here is the gospel. Remember Jesus' call of discipleship when he said, repent and believe the good news. See, we all struggle in various different parts of that spectrum from womb to tomb. There are different people in our world that we don't value, that we don't love, that we don't defend. This is an issue that should cause all of us to repent. But Jesus says, that's not where it ends. Where does it end? It ends in the gospel. It ends in faith in Jesus. Jesus calls all of us to follow him. And when we do so, we realize that we are a lot more alike than we think we are. Because we're all sinners. We're all people who are stuck in that cycle of life and death. We cannot celebrate death. We cannot condone it. We must always be working to value and defend human life, whether that's in the unborn, whether that's in people with disabilities, whether that's in the elderly, whether that's in people we don't like, whether that's in people who are different from us, wherever it is, we must be about that business. But that doesn't make us better or worse than those that don't do these things. <laughs> we are all sinners. What we want to be about is what Jesus was inviting those first disciples to do, to call the world to see the cycle of death, the cycle of sin that we are all trapped in has been broken. There is forgiveness and there is life in Jesus. In no one else is that found not in any other teachers, not in any other philosophers, not in any other people of high position or power. It's found in Jesus alone because of his death on the cross, because of his resurrection on the third day. And Jesus called those first disciples to follow him so that they would receive that. The call hasn't changed. Jesus calls all of us to continue to follow him, to receive that life and forgiveness that's in him alone, and then to go out, 
to go out and share that good news. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus. For in him, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of forgiveness. The kingdom of life everlasting. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. As we come to our time of offerings, I just want to reflect a little bit on the very short reading from the book of Jonah. Jonah is probably a part of the Bible that you're sort of familiar with. We all know the story of Jonah being swallowed by that great big fish. But the book of Jonah is a lot about a lot more than just a, a big fish. It is about a reluctant servant, about how Jonah is unwilling to do what God has called him to do. And what was it that God had called him to do? To preach his word to a group of people known as the Ninevites. These were not good people at all. Think of the worst kind of people in our world today, and the Ninevites would probably be considered worse. And when God called Jonah to proclaim his word to them, Jonah thought, no way, no how. Because Jonah knew that they just might listen to God's word, and they just might repent. They just might believe that word, and they too would be God's people. They too would know God's love and forgiveness. And Jonah wasn't so sure that he wanted to see God's love shown to people like that. It's a very convicting story to me, because to all of us, there are always people in this world that we kind of look down upon people that we consider to be worse than us or the wrong kind of people. But God's love, he doesn't have those same kind of boundaries. God's love, it it goes to all kinds of people. It goes to all people. And through the ministry here at St. Paul's, we would pray that we would go to all kinds of people. Yes, people who are like us, but also people who are not like us at all. Yes, to people who share our values, but also to those who don't. Because the one thing behind all of this is we have an all-compassionate God who sent Jesus, his son, to die for the sins of the whole world. When you give your tithes and your offerings, We pray that we would be faithful in that service to God, that we would not be reluctant servants who would turn away from God's work, but instead that we would go about it with joy to know that God loves not just us, but the whole world. So thank you for your tithes and your offerings. Thank you for supporting the ministry of the gospel of Jesus here at St. Paul's. Amen. Dear friends, let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Almighty Father, receive our praise and thanksgiving for your great love shown into the world through in your word, calling all to repentance, giving all a second chance at life by a new birth by your spirit. May you be praised by all nations in the revelation of yourself through Jesus, your only Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As you called and sent Jonah and your holy prophets, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and your blessed apostles, so continue to call and send pastors and workers into your kingdom in our day, that many may hear, receive, and believe your word of grace and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let the nations praise you, O God. Let all the nations praise you. Guide and direct the minds and hearts of all leaders in government that peace may prevail, evil be punished, and good rewarded. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your heart, O God, is moved by your great love, especially for all who struggle with sin and sickness. We pray for all in need of your healing, for all who cannot defend themselves, and for all who mourn. We pray that you be with those hospitalized this past week, especially we pray for Mary Wheeler, for Del Somme and Christine Voss, for Judy Ashby and Adeline Weber, for those facing surgeries and procedures, for Jean Gephardt and Nancy Mitzner, Chris Summerall and Anna Warner, and for those on hospice care, for Ruth Bogelman. Also be with those who continue treatment and healing at home. We pray for them and all those we name in our hearts now. O Lord, comfort them with a word of your grace and power to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. No greater love do we know than the sacrifice of Jesus, his body and blood given and shed on the cross. Open our hearts and our mouths to receive forgiveness, love, and strength through this sacrament, and be given strength to confess Jesus as the only Savior of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remembering those who have gone before us with the sign of faith, we pray you remember us in your kingdom and bring us to the fullness of life in the day of the resurrection of all flesh. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we do pray for St. Paul's Lutheran School and, and all Lutheran schools across our country and, and across the world as we conclude the celebration of Lutheran Schools Week. We ask for your blessings, O Lord, and pray that you would bless not only our teachers, and aides and staff, but also our parents and students of our school, as they daily learn of their Lord and their Savior Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders and for all those who serve in law enforcement. We pray, O oh Lord, that through all the unrest of last year and this year now, we pray that your peace would reign we pray that the plans of the evil one would be undone and that you would bless our nation with your guidance, your presence, and especially your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, go with the blessing of our good and gracious God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's continue as we sing our closing hymn.